All right, um, this is the third micro one lecture. And in this one, we're gonna actually uh, uh, gonna write a little program for the Viva board for the PIC 16F 1829. And I'm gonna try and go through that. We will do this one in assembly language. And um, hopefully you'll see that it's fairly straightforward. There are some pieces we have to talk about. We'll also talk a little bit about um, the instruction set and we'll talk about uh, We'll talk about the block diagram a little bit. So we've got a few things to cover. Um, I think first I'm going to just talk about how to write a program for the PIC. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to first I'm going to show you the little PIC. We'll uh, we'll sh switch cameras here for a second. So here's the PIC, and you notice we got this green light blinking, and it's uh, so we're going to write a program to make this light blink now. I, I went ahead and installed my CR2102 board, uh, but you don't need to. Uh, I just put it on. But you can actually power your, your pick through this board. I also plugged in, uh, I took a USB cord, cut off the, 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 the end that wasn't the standard A connector, and, uh, and soldered on this jack so I could just plug it into the, uh, to the board. So this is really a nice, convenient way to do it. Uh, if you're powering it, for, regardless of whether you're powering it from the this this uh, CR2102 um, board or, or from your battery or from a, a USB port, uh, you still have to put the jumper here to get power over to the chip. And uh, this switch doesn't really serve as an on-off switch. This switch uh, basically serves to switch between this power input and uh, which is which? This is say if you put, have a nine volt battery driving it, this nine volts goes through this regulator to generate. Um, I forget which one's which, but to generate 5.0 volts, and this regulator to generate 3.3 uh, volts, and then this jumper selects between five and 3.3. This uh, little header has a five volt and a 3.3 volt supply also, um, and this switch, if it's in a down position, is selecting the 3.3 volt and the 5 volt supply from this header and you again jumper select over here to decide which one goes to the chip. Now the the 3.3 volts is uh, usually fairly close but the 5 volts may not be to the actual 5 volts or maybe it's the other way around but anyway this header doesn't necessarily provide uh, the exact voltage level it claims but these these uh, two voltage linear voltage regulators definitely do. So um, so you so generally I recommend you power it using either a USB input here or a 9 volt battery. Remember though uh, you need to switch in the up position to get the power from here and the down position from here and and if you if you have a battery plugged in regardless of the switch position this battery is still powering these regulators and it will uh, run down a battery overnight so don't leave your battery plugged in if you don't want to run it down overnight. Okay now, uh, so that's sort of the power. And uh, this may not be perfect. I think in a future generation, we will have an on-off switch on it. And we'll probably also still allow you to power it from the CR2102 uh, jumper. Um, anyway, uh, so down here, the flashing thing, that is actually a red, uh, uh, blue, green, uh, three-colored LED. And it is connected so that it has a common um, anode. So all three LEDs are connected to one anode, and that's connected to power. The cathodes are connected to uh, pin RA5, uh, pin uh, RA2, and pin RC6. The green light goes through RA5. So, so we'll, we'll cover all this in more detail, but I'm just sort of laying out. To make this board work, there's a couple things you have to do. Here's our chip. The first thing you have to do is get power to the chip. And that's that's why we have these linear regulators and the CR212 adapter and this plug here. And then this little uh, three pin header where we can jump or two pins and provide either five volts or 3.3. You don't have to have it set up to provide 3.3 uh, or five volts. You can run it at anything from I think about 1.8 uh, volts all the way up to 5.5 volts. Um, and so you could just put a put a uh, two 
one and a half volt batteries uh, in a little battery holder giving you three volts and you could run it on that that would be fine and there's other ways you can run it too uh, the this um, so getting power to the chips one of the first things you do we use these linear supplies so our power would be nice and regular and uh, it would allow us to connect to other devices and uh, have some confidence about what voltage we're running at we also have some capacitors here a couple of capacitors here uh, another one over here that basically provide despiking and filtering and we use two different values we use uh, a larger one and a smaller one very close to the actual uh, chip and we and we use them with as short a lead as possible which is pretty easy to do when you do surface mount so these are two surface mount caps one big and one little one's a one i think is a is a 10 uh microfarad and the other one is maybe a tenth or maybe even less uh, microfarads so that uh, you can get different uh, different uh, different effects the, the bigger capacitor handles the the power drains when everything switches inside the chip uh, and the little capacitor filters out uh, glitchy noise that might be uh, coming in on the battery line from you know who knows where all right so so um so that's the power you also need to uh need to have some ability to program it and so we have a programming header right here and it's a it's a six pin header but only five pins are used and it's all laid out very specifically how that works and that's where your snap plugs in i'm not using a snap i'm using a little fancier programmer uh, but uh, snap works fine snap is a, actually a really good programmer and um so uh take advantage of that um, we have a, another jumper over here and there's a, another three pin over here this jumper if it's on the the, the t pins to towards this header it's it switches it makes this push button here a master clear push button if you jumper the other two pins it makes this push button and a rb7 uh, push button input so those are the two uh, positions on that one up here you select voltage down here this jumper selects the function of this push button and uh, we're going to use um, in the, I think in the lab we're going to use the push button over here we have a two transistor switch and it has a little two pin jack right here that connects so all you have to do is run a wire from some pin and connect it over here and when you drive that pin high it'll turn this switch on and you, you can use this junction box then to connect whatever you want to connect uh, to this two transistor switch and uh, that actually works fairly well the true the two transistor switch uh, delivers battery power so if you have a nine volt battery hooked up you'll deliver nine volts in ground uh, if you have your uh, a USB plugged in it'll deliver five volts in ground so that's how that works now uh, so to make this chip work you just need power and you need a pull-up resistor on the master clear pin, which happens to be R, R, RA3. And you need a programming header. The programming header has to connect to power. Well, master, it connects to the master clear pin, which is RA3. And you have to have a pull-up resistor, a 10K resistor, pulling up to the power supply. In this case, uh, I think we have it set for 3.3 volts. Then the next pin connects to RA0. The next pin connects to RA1, so it's RA, it's uh, ground, uh, RA0, RA1. The next pin connects to power, so that's over here. That's this pin. And then the next pin connects to ground, that's that pin. And that, and then that's it. You just have, or sorry, I didn't, I, I, I mixed that up. The first pin is master clear. The next pin is power. The next pin is ground. The next pin is RA0, and the next pin is RA1. So we're using three of the uh, of the pins on this chip for the programming and debug purposes, and uh, you so you can't use RA zero, RA one, and you can't use RA three for anything else. Uh, you you could program it and then uh, take off a jumper or move jumpers around and then have it hooked up for these pins to do something else. That would be totally legal, but uh, so you could. You, you could do that but in our case because we want to use the debug features then we we need to leave these pins connected all the time so we can use debug features so you really can't use them 
for your project. Uh, all right, so so that's three pins. So and then of course power and ground. So, so that that takes away five of the twenty. So we're we're left with fifteen GPIO pins that can be used for general purpose input output. Now that's really all of the all of the care and feeding you have to do to get this chip running. Uh, you do ha also have to have a programmer. Uh, the snap will work just fine. Uh, in fact, the snap will program I think any microprocessor chip microchip makes. All right, so here's our here's our programmer connection here, and then we have a few extra things. We've got this little USB thing, and we've got this but push button, and we've got choices of power supplies and a two transistor switch. But basically, all that's just extra stuff and an RGB LED. But we really don't have to have that. All we have to have is power and the master clear pin pulled high to 3.3 uh, volts or 5 volts with a 10K resistor. That's all we really have to have. And uh, if you want to program it in circuit, then you have to hook up these other pins, RA0, RA1, and the master clear pin, and away you go. Okay, now that's the electrical side. On the hardware side, um, uh, sorry, on the software side, there's some things we have to do as well. And so I'm going to shift to the... Uh, to the integrated development environment so you can see what that would look like and I think I'll just put this right over here so you can see it all right so here's my integrated development environment and uh, I have a little routine but I'm going to switch to one that's not all pre-done which is right here uh, let's see did I get it yeah there we go now you this is so when you set the code up and I'll go through that we'll talk about that in lab we'll walk you through that basically to start a new project you go up here under file you hit new project it, microchip enabled standalone project you won't have this 32-bit harmony thing in there uh, click that type in PIC PIC 16F 1829 and then notice there's this 1829 LIN, that's an automobile part, uh, don't use that. We just want that one, click next, and then uh, next. Then uh, you are not gonna use a header, I'll explain that later on in the course. But um, And then I'm using an ICD4 programmer, here's its serial number, you can click on either one of these, and click next. And then here are your options for uh, your uh, C compiler, and for your assembler. We're going to use assembly language, so I'm just going to select that. If we we're going to use C, I would have selected the C, and then I just give the project a name. And uh, we'll, we'll, in this case, I named it, um, well, I, it, I just by default named it uh, New Pick 8B Simple Assembly or something. Um, so you type something in there, and well, we'll type something in. And then, so we'll hit um, test, test F20. Uh, okay, now I'll hit finish. This is going to create a directory called test F20, and it's going to go ahead and put uh, uh, really uh, just a few uh, uh, files associated with a compilation. Now, uh, if I switch to this new one that I just did, um, Uh, and where did I where did it wind up? Let's see, what did I call it? Should have paid more attention. Uh, Does have one? Let's see. Sorry. Um, oh, good. Okay, this is it. My test F20. Okay, there it is right here. So I'm gonna. So if I, here's my file right there. If you look at it, you'll see. And, and let me um, let me go ahead and put my face down here so you guys can see me while I'm talking. Uh, 
Okay, so if I put a, so I, now I have test F20 here. Now notice if I if I open all these little pluses, there's nothing. It, well, there's this make file, but that's it. There's nothing else. And the make file is sort of a system routine. You don't really have to mess with it. If I want to add a source file, which I do, I want to highlight the source file, and then I want to right click on it. And we seem to be in lock mode at the moment. Okay, there we go. So here's a source file. So I'm going to click on the source file. I'm going to right click and it says new and I'm going to go down here to pick eight simple assembly. I'm going to click that. It's going to click this. I'll give it a name. Um, I'll call it test test F20 assembly. Okay. And then I'll say finish. And there it is. And I could get rid of these other two things. Maybe I'll do that so we don't have to look at them. Okay, so here's my code. Now notice there's a couple of green comments, and they're always triggered by a semicolon in assembly language for uh, microchip MPASM. Uh, to do insert configuration code here using configuration bit generator. And then down here, uh, add interrupt if it's used here. And then down here, we have a go to dollar sign, which means it's just in an infinite loop. So we have to replace this line with our actual code. All right. So notice, though, we have a couple of things here. The uh, Put the interrupt here. So there's a, there's a location for interrupts uh, for the interrupt service routine, which we're not going to use in this code. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's this... Uh, thing called uh, reset vector code 0000. So this is the first location in program memory and this is where when you power the board up or when you reset it you you transfer execution to this location and in this location I've placed my very first instruction and that instruction says go to and then it gives a label. The label is start and if you look down here you'll see here's where the label start is and it's somewhere in program memory. It, it, if I don't have anything else here, it, it would be in location two. But I could have a big interrupt service routine here, so it could be spaced way down too. But in any event, go to figures out where that start is, and it generates, the, puts the right number in here to jump to start. And then in this little routine, I say go to dollar sign. Well, go, dollar sign is the previous uh, program location. So what I'm saying is jump to this same instruction, which means I just keep jumping and jumping right back to that go-to statement. So I actually don't go, ever go anywhere else. I just stay in a little tight loop right there. And then I have the end directive that tells the compiler that's the end of the code, or tells the assembler that's the end of the code. Okay, now I need to add uh, a couple of things. First, to make this chip work, we have to set some, uh, some configuration bits inside the chip. These are, these are bits that are set when we flash our code into the chip uh, and they're they're there when the chip is powered down they're there when the chip is powered up and they basically tell the chip uh, some basic operating uh, things and we're going to go through these in some detail but uh, I'm going to do it right now but you only really know, need to know a little bit about this initially and then you'll learn a little more as time goes on and later on when we do the sleep lab and the watchdog lab we will we'll, we'll change some of these configuration bits and I'll point out the important ones. So first we need to bring up that window. So I'm going to do that here. I have a window command, uh, target memory views, configuration bits. So I click it there. And then it brings up this little floating window for me. Uh, your window may be attached. I don't know why mine's floating. But anyway, here it is. And, uh, and these are all the configuration bits that are available to us. There's quite a few of them. And maybe I'll expand it a little so we can see most of them. Um, so we have two configuration words. There's the first word, and here's the start of the second word, and there's the rest of the second word. And um, Oh, that, no, I, I'm sorry. These are identical. So I only need one of these. I don't know how we got two copies, but we did. We just need one copy. So I'm going to, maybe I double-clicked it. So I'm going to kill this, and I'm going to click it one more time. And I don't know why it, uh... well, 
one, two, three. Oh, I see. It's just sliding this. Okay. All right. So we just have this one copy. All right. Now, um, notice the first field is the oscillator selection. I have two choices. And this is, so I have two configuration words. And they're in addresses 8007 hex and 8008 hex. So these are actually above my, uh, my 8000 locations for my that I can put program memory instruction program instructions into uh, these are kind of special registers and they are they are sort of part of program memory and these these get read on power up and they configure our chip to do certain things the first thing we want to do is decide how we're going to run the oscillator so I'm going to I'm going to expand this so you can see this a little better and even more I guess, is that it? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so that's the end of it. Okay, so uh, so I don't want this ECH heading, which is the default, because that stands for external clock, high power mode, high power mode. So we're gonna, we would, if we had an external oscillator, we were driving the chip, which which you can do. Uh, we would, we would, we would select this, but we don't. We want to use the internal oscillator module. So I'm going to select internal oscillator. And then, then there's several things. Watchdog timer, I want to turn it off. So I'll select off. The power up timer enable, off. Master clear on. We are going to use master clear because we're going to use the in-circuit programmer, and that requires master clear. Then we have this code protect and code protect data. These are bits we can turn on to keep anybody from reading anything on our chip, either reading the program or reading any data. Now, the reason why we want to do this, uh, in some situations, is we might want to, we might have spent a lot of time and effort developing our code, and we don't want anybody just to go out and buy our product and then immediately, uh, you know, reverse engineer and copy our code. Uh, so we're gonna, so so if we wanted to protect it, we would turn this on. But in our case, we do not want to do that because uh, you cannot read. Uh, this limits what you can do, and it turns off, I think, a lot of your debug features. So we, we want to leave this off. Now, brownout enable. This this is what allows the chip to have a graceful shutdown if it's being operated on batteries and the batteries discharge. Uh, and as the battery voltage gets lower and lower, you get to the point where the, where the processor no longer runs uh, reliably. And when it drops into this unreliable operation, it can overwrite certain areas of your program memory you didn't want overwritten and do some bad things. So we want it to we want it to just shut down instead of uh, instead of flailing around as it's as the battery dies. And so this is what brownout protection uh, is. We can leave this on. We can turn this off. We're not going to have a brownout problem because, uh, or even if we do, we don't care. We'll just reprogram the chip. But if you had it in programmed into a device that you set out in the middle of the desert or shot into space you would definitely want this turned on. Okay, now um, if you want to see your clock output on an oscilloscope or you want to use it to drive other packages on your on your printed circuit board, then you can turn on the clock out. But if you do, it's going to take up another pin. So we're going to leave this off. But uh, at some point, uh, and maybe even today, uh, but at some point I'll, I'll turn this on and I'll show you how, what the clock out looks like. Uh, maybe I'll do that today. And then we have this... Uh, in, internal external switchover. That's if you have an internal an internal clock and an external clock, and you and you and you're going to switch back and forth between them. Normally, what happens is when you first power it up, your external clock's not working that well, and you let the internal clock run things until the external clock gets up to full speed. It's working great, and then you switch over. And this is an automatic feature just to make it a little nicer. Uh, we're going to turn this off since we're not going to use it. And then we have fail-safe clock memory. Uh, and uh, that what that does is if your external clock fails, it'll switch over to the internal clock. Well, we're not going to have an external clock, so we're just going to leave this off. Then uh, we have a few more things we have to set. Flash memory self-write protection. So this is your program memory, and you uh, the chip does have ability to write to its own program memory, but uh, sometimes we'll turn this off so it won't overwrite instructions accidentally. And uh, so we'll just leave it off for now. Um, and then we have this phase lock loop. 
it's part of our uh, oscillator module and uh, we if we were going to run this at maximum speed we'd need this turned on but you can turn it on in software and we're not going to turn it on in hardware we're just going to leave it off so we'll put it off and then we have this stack underflow overflow enable uh, we have a 16 level hardware stack and if we extend if we exceed the capacity of that 16 level stack then that's when we get this error um, and we can just leave that on for now so we'll leave it on okay and then brownout voltage selection what happens if the voltage drops this is the level this is where you get to set the level but since we turned it off or I guess we left it on doesn't really matter we'll set it for the low voltage and then finally we have low voltage programming now everybody listen up this one is important if if you by default it's always starts off on but if you turn this off you can program that one time with your snap but after that your snap can't program it anymore because you turned it off and you have to have it on in order for the snap to program the chip because this snap uses low voltage programming so don't turn this off leave it on and if you get it turned off you haven't destroyed your chip or anything we just have to go get a programmer which can do high voltage programming and program that bit back into the on position and then your snap will work again uh, but if you program it off with your snap your snap can't program back program it back on you have to get another programmer all right so once we have all this we're going to do we're going to click this button down here which says generate source code to output and then you're going to see uh, down here we'll shrink this down and move it uh, and let's see where did it uh, show up uh, output here so we have the source code right here and it put a couple of uh, information comments in it put, said it's a PIC 16 F1829 configuration bit settings assembly source list, assembly source line config statements and then it said include PIC 16 F1829.inc this include file just brings in uh, a whole bunch of names for uh, numbered locations so I can say port A instead of having to say uh, 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 I don't know bank one or bank zero location uh, uh, 21 or something I don't know this is pretty helpful so you should we should always have this file and and it it makes our 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 assembler listings much more readable we have the same thing in C but in C we call them dot H files for header files uh, but here we call them dot INC files for include and these all are included in your library when you uh, when you download MPASM okay X MPASM X or sorry uh, uh, MP lab X all right and then here are our two config files and oh we have this include statement yeah I said that so we're gonna we're gonna get all this I'm gonna start here I'll copy all this including our two comments and we'll we'll hit control C and then we'll go up here in our program and we'll get rid of this and we'll put these in right there and so there are configuration files and our include files and we're all set and then usually it's really good to go up here and uh, put a comment in and I'll, I'll go ahead and start the first line the only thing you should ever start in the first position are labels and comments okay so I'm gonna say uh, by I'll say by dr. Morton and then um, then we'll add another comment and I'll say just a blink routine There we go. Okay, just a blink routine. R O U T I N E. Okay, and then sometimes I'll put a date. So we'll we'll say uh, August 31, uh, 2020. Uh, sorry, 20, 2020. Okay, those are just comments. You don't have to put them, but you really should. And in fact, you should put more than this. And we'll talk about that later in the course. Uh, all right so here here's our include file there are configuration statements these are all things we need to have 
Now, I usually like to do one more uh, uh, thing. Uh, I like to put in a, uh, a radix, and I like to put in a, uh, another comment about the chip type. So let me, um, let me, so in order to get those correct, I'm just going to bring back in one of these things I had. Let's see, where is it? Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, Blink F20. Yeah, this one. So we have a source file here. Okay, there's this is more developed code. I'm just going to steal a couple things. This list routine, and uh, this is just a little list directive, and it and it it tells it that uh, to print it out in the in the format that we like to use with this chip, and it sets the radix for decimal. So if you don't specify any number you type, will be considered a decimal, and that's what we want. So I'm just going to copy this. And then I'm going to paste it in over here. Uh, and it can just go in right there, I think. All right. And these, this, this include, this list, these configuration things, and some of these other lines on here, these are all uh, assembler directives. They just tell the assembler what, the, what we want it to do. And uh, so that's all good. All right. Now, um, let's see. Uh, so now we, we have this all set up. Now when the program loads and starts to execute, the first instruction is loaded here at location zero because we said reset vector, uh, uh, reset vector code 0x0000. Zero 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 zero. So that's zero hex, and that's our first program location, and it says go to start. Starts right here, and so it's going to, whatever a location start is assigned is going to be filled in here for the go to and it will jump up here. The reason we do that is because we want to save location 4 for interrupts if we're going to use them. In this particular code we're not, but um, but later on we will. And then uh, we have this forever loop. We don't need that, so I'm just going to get rid of that. And instead we'll uh, write some code. Now I'm going to use a little cheat sheet just because it helps me. The first thing I want to do is use assembly language to set up my uh, to set up some uh, to set up the 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 the, the oscillator. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to bank select the OSCON here. I'm going to uh, put six alpha into W, and I'm going to write W into OSCON. And then I'm also going to configure some registers. I'm going to configure uh, Tris A uh, to make uh, pin five. A uh, output, and then pin, uh, and then we can then we select uh, Tris B, um, and we're going to make uh, Tris B an input, uh, and it's going to be the input. Uh, pin seven is going to be the input, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be the input for our push button, uh, and then we're going to turn off our analog select bits. Uh, in case there were any for pin 7. It turns out there aren't, but uh, there, there could be. And, uh, and then we're all done. So we're going to set up, we're going to set up our oscillator and configure our ports right here. And so we'll go ahead and copy this over. Okay, and then what I want to do, uh, I'm just going to paste this in here, right, uh, I'll paste it in right here, not in the first column. My label starts in the first column, so I'm going to space out of that, and I'll go over here just a little bit. Maybe I should have used an, uh, a tab key. No, okay, I'm going to space it. One, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and now I'm going to write all that down. And then, uh, then this brings us down. So this gets us set up. It configures uh, our clock, our oscillator. So we so we have a four megahertz clock, and it also uh, configures our, our two of our ports, uh, RA five and uh, RB seven. The RB seven is the uh, push button input, and the RA five is the output to the green LED. And those are the only things we're going to use. Now. Uh, 
There's a couple more things that we have to set up. Uh, we want to be able to blink the light. So I'm just going to go over and, and grab some of this right off the bat. Um, so we're going to have a little loop where we're going to, where we're going to blink our uh, LED, and I'm going to call it blink loop. So I'm just going to copy it here, and we will paste it in here. And right here, like this. Now, blink loop is a label, so it has to go in the first column. So I'm going to back it up. Oops. Okay, sorry, keep screwing it up. Okay, one space. Okay, that I guess is yeah. That's the first loop. First, that's the first column. So we do want our label in the first column, and then. Um, it might recognize it anyway, but it's better for them to do it like they ask you to. And then we're going to set up to blink uh, port A pin 5. That's the green LED. And it's going to be on when the pin is low and off when the pin is high. And then we're also going to check to see if our uh, push button is pressed or not. Since it's on RB7, when we don't push it, it's going to read 1. When we do push it, it's going to read 0 because of the way we wired it in. And so uh, if, if it reads, so this is going to be bit test F skip set. Well, if it's set, it's going to just, if it's, if it's set, then, uh, which is, means not pushed, then it's going to skip this go to statement. But if on the other hand it is pushed, it's going to go right back up here to blink loop, and it's going to stay in a tight little loop right here. And if that happens, then the LED will stay in the off, uh, in the, on position. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set, uh, then we're going to do this, uh, we're going to bank select uh, the output latch for, for port A, and that's L-A-T-A. And what that bank select is doing, we'll explain better later on, but basically it puts the bank register to point at the bank that, that at, at, the, at the data bank that latch A is in. And if we look at the data sheet, we can see that latch A, uh, I think it's in bank two or something like that. Now we can do that. Uh, I think I did have the data sheet up here just a minute ago. If I can remember where. Well, maybe I didn't. All right, well, if I shrink this down and I go get the data sheet, which is right here, and I click it, we'll make it come up. And here it is. And uh, all I have to do then to, I just go to the memory uh, chapter. So you can see the memory organization here at chapter three. And we'll scroll down to our banks, which I showed you before. And when we get to the banks, we can see exactly where, uh, where that uh, latch A is, L-A-T-A. -A. So Again, core registers, first 12, so you don't worry about those. Uh, but starting right here with register 13, oops. And on down, those are the first three. Uh, and then there's another couple. Now, if we look at this, notice this is bank zero. We have port ABC. Bank one, we have Tris ABC. And bank two, we have lat A ABC. So, so it is bank two. So when I say bank cell lat A, it looks into its in, include file, knows that lat A is, is, uh, has a number of one zero Charlie hex, knows that's bank two, and it goes ahead and puts the number, the number two into the bank select register, the BSR, so we're pointing at the right bank. And then the location in that bank is actually going to be in our next instruction. That's the offset, and that's within the instruction. So let me shrink this and bring this back. And so, so that's going to uh, get us ready to point to uh, the latch. Uh, I don't know where latch A go. Right here. So bank select latch A. Bit set F latch A5. Called time delay. Bank select latch A. Bit clear F latch A5. So basically, we're just clearing the bit that represents lat, la, latch A, uh, and we're, we're setting it and clearing it. Setting it, um, setting it 
uh, turns off my LED and clearing it turns it on. Now notice I do I do this call delay right after I set it and then right after I clear it I do call today and after I do call delay then I do go to blink loop. Go to blink loop takes us back here and I'm so I'm just doing this continually in a loop until I would branch out. In this case, I never branch out. I just stay in this tight little loop. and that, So it means it blinks the light to the end. All right, so uh, so if we paste all these things in, the one thing that I didn't show yet, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't show you uh, the T delay routine, and uh, it's not somehow it got left out of this code. So, anyway, uh, I, I may I'll probably have to finish this on Thursday. But I wanted to give you sort of a sort of a feel. So, so this is this is um, yeah, and here's my here's my blink delay code here. This this little routine uh, gives you about uh, three fourths of a second delay, and I'll explain that too. So the main features I want you to take away from, from today, I, I, there's some boilerplate things I have to always do. One, I have to, uh, I have to put in some include file, and I like to put this list directive. But the include file gets automatically included when I put in my configuration words. And here, this one is bad because it's, it shows low voltage programming off. And the reason it shows that is because when we use pick hit threes, we always turned it off. But now we use snaps, we always leave it on. And it starts off on by default. This this is another compiler director directory here, and that says C block x30, and then I have some variable names, and then I have NC block. And this is a way to name some variables, just like in C where you do you know chars and ints and floats. Here we just set aside a, a storage space. So to let delay is going to be 30, delay one is going to be 31, and loop count is going to be 32. And so whenever I want to uh, use those, these are these are these three random access memory locations. And again, if I go back to my um, if I go back to my data sheet, notice uh, I, my general purpose uh, registers. So zero, uh, I forget what I put there. Did I put uh, thirty? Yeah, I started at thirty. So so my uh, the actual general purpose RAM start at 20 hex, but I put uh, I put 30, so I'm I'm going to be down here uh, 10 more hex, um, or actually 16 more um, locations, 10 more hex, 16 decimal, and uh, and then I have three uh, variables in this little uh, general purpose RAM area that I'm using up for my uh, counter. All right, and of course you've got you've got a, a, a 1k bytes of, of random access memory you can use spread across the first 12 banks or so. Okay, now uh, once I get these variables, that's what I use down here in my delay routine. And all my delay routine is is just a counter. Okay, it's just, uh, sorry, down here. It's just a counter. This is a delay routine. And all this delay routine does is counts, but it, 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 uses, uh, it's kind of a nested counter, it uses two 8-bit registers because if it just counts uh, 8 bits, it's just counting the 256. So that goes by really fast when you're executing uh, a million instructions a second. Because with a clock of 4 million, we are, our instruction clock is, a, is one fourth of our oscillator clock. So uh, one fourth of four millions a million. So we're executing instruction uh, every a million times a second, with the exception of branches that take two seconds, uh, that take uh, two cycles. So, uh, but all the rest of the instructions take one cycle, uh, one uh, one FOS divided by four. So one instruction cycle, which in this case, uh, FOS divided by four is one million, uh, and that means we're executing a million instructions a second. Branches will take two. Uh, so we'll be a little bit less than that, but not too much. All right, so if I count to 256 uh, in a loop of four or five instructions, executing them uh, a million instructions a second, 
you can see I'm definitely going to get to 256 before my seconds, before I'm anywhere close to one second. So what I do is I have a second byte. I count, I count to 256, and then I, and I count one in the other byte. I count to 256, and I count one in the, another one in the other byte. And I count both bytes until I get all the way up to 250, 255 in my other byte. And that, that gives me a, a, something about a half second delay, something like that. So now that's all I really need, uh, or maybe it's closer. Yeah, it's about three quarters of a second, maybe. So that gives me a little bit of a delay so I can see this light. Now, let me, let me run that, uh, or let me show you a picture of it running, because um, it is running right now. And I'm going to expand this, and then I'll switch cameras. Okay, so here it is. And you can see that's my green light, and it's blinking at, at that rate of about, um, uh, it's a little faster than, uh, it's a little faster than a second. Now remember, I have two delays in my code. I turn the light off, and I delay. I turn it on, and I delay, and then I start back over. Turn it off, delay, on, delay, off, delay, on, delay. If I didn't do that, it would either appear always off or always on. You have to delay it uh, after every change in order to see it because remember uh, it, it's turning on and off. And, um, you know, if you just ran straight through it, those instructions are executing a million of them per second. So you would have a, such a short time of it being off or on that you would you would uh, it would appear not to be blinking. It would appear just continuous, maybe at half brightness or something. So uh, so you do have to uh, you do have to have two delays. And um, and the, the two delays added together are probably three quarters of a second, something like that, just a little less than a second. Okay, so that's that's this. Now I also put the 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 push button, and if I push that push button, I'm going to read that, and I'm going to not go through my blink loop. So watch what happens if I put my finger down here, and I punch it. It'll le it'll leave it in the on mode, and the reason for that is. I, the first instruction in my blink routine is to turn it off, and the last instruction is to turn it on. So, it, so if I don't execute my routine, then it gets left on. That's why it stays on. It doesn't matter. When I push it, it'll stay on. Now, I can change this around so my push button does different things. It might leave it. If, if I push it when it's on, it might keep it on. If I push it when it's off, it might keep it off. Uh, but it, the way it's set up now, no matter when I push it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put it in the permanently on state. All right. So let me switch the camera back. Yeah. So, so this gives you a pretty good idea. Uh, now, the way this works, I'm going to walk through this routine one time. But we're going to spend a lot more time on this. So you're going to understand every single thing we're doing. Remember, up here... This first little bit, all I'm doing is setting the clock for 4 megahertz. And then I'm configuring my uh, port A, pin 5, and port B, pin 7. One for the LED, the green LED, and one for the push button. They're already wired up on the printed circuit board. So they're already connected to these things. So I can't change what they're connected to without uh, getting out a knife and cutting traces on my printed circuit board and soldering in some new wires. Uh, but we've carefully selected what we've left things hooked up to in order to make this as, uh, as uh, flexible and, and functional as possible. Uh, but, but these connections are pretty well hardwired on the printed circuit board. Now, down here, this is my actual blink loop. And you can see at the bottom of this blink loop, I have a go-to blink loop. So this goes through, when it hits the bottom, it comes up here and starts all over and goes again. And it just keeps running through this at the rate of a whole bunch per second because obviously we're executing a million instructions per second. So this is going to go through this loop pretty quickly. However, notice here, uh, I check. So here's what it happens. I first I bank select port B, so I'm pointing to bank zero, and I test pin seven in port B to see if it's low. If it's low. Then, uh, and I do that with a bis tab step skip clear or skip set. If it's set, it jumps over this go to. But if it's, cl if, if it's clear, which means it's putting out a zero, which means the button's pushed, 
then it's going to branch right back up here and it's only going to execute these instructions nothing else so so it won't ever turn the light off now the next thing that happens is i bang select the latch a and then i bit set f latch a comma five so what this does this takes uh they, this takes bit five and latch a and and sets it to a one and now because of the way the light the led is hooked up with the common anode connected to power and the individual cathodes connected to the pin so so pin five pin ra5 connects to the green led cathode to the negative lead of the green led it goes through a current limiting resistor and connects to the pin so if i take the pin high i will turn off the led because now both ends of the led are connected to 3.3 volts but uh, if i on the other hand set that pin to a zero then the anode's connected to 3.3 volts and the cathode's connected to the ground and it'll turn on the led okay once i turn it turn it off in this case then i uh, call my delay routine jumps down here and counts to 65,000 by using two 8-bit registers and a nested internal counter. When it finishes counting to 65,000, it jumps out and comes back and does bank select latch A again in case it got changed down here, which it should. And then and then it does bank, bit clear F lat A comma 5. So bit 5 and latch A gets set to a zero, cleared. When that happens, the LED turns on. Then I go down here to blink delay, and I do this again. I count to 65,000 at the rate of about, uh, uh, about I don't know, uh, the loop has, I don't know, the loop doesn't have that many instructions. So it, it's, it runs it in about, it counts to 65,000 in about three quarters of a second. And then once it does that, it says go to blink loop, goes right back up here and executes these same instructions again. So, so that's how it works. Note each time I check one of these locations, lat five or port B, I do the bank select so that I have my bank register pointing to the right place. Now you would think, well, why can't I just leave it here? Well, cause I call, t I call this time delay, this T delay routine and I'm changing, I may be, I might be changing where these things are, are put because I do a bank cell delay. And indeed I do because I, I, I'm pointing to a different bank potentially. So uh, the latches in bank two and uh, delays in bank zero. All right, once that's done, then I'm, uh, then I just return. And this is what's called, it's like a function call in C, but in assembly language, you call it a subroutine. Uh, and uh, subroutines uh, are just declared here, and they they have they stop when you have a return command. So this runs until it, until it finally drops through down here. What it uses to do this branching is this decrement f skip on zero instruction, and this bit test f skip clear. Uh, so we'll explain all that. But you these all the branches. Uh, all the conditional branches in C, uh, sorry, in the assembler language for uh, MPLAB, uh, this, all the branches are, use this uh, skip on uh, situation. Sometimes they skip on set, sometimes they skip on clear. Uh, this one skips on zero. So when the, when this uh, delay plus one is zero, it skips because it's zero. And what it skips is the go to inner loop, and then it drops through and goes uh, goes back to, hits the return command and goes back to wherever your code uh, had just finished calling the, the, the time delay. So it would pick up with this next bank cell. Okay, so that's how the program works. Uh, let's see, so that took, uh, that took enough time. So I think I'm gonna stop with that. I didn't really do too many other slides. Maybe, maybe I'll just talk about the slides real briefly. Let me do that. So, um, so here's the block diagram, and I'm going to put my face back in here. Hopefully, that'll be nice so you can see me. 
All right, so there's my, there, there I am. And uh, here's the block diagram. So a couple of things I want you to see here. Um, we have, uh, we, we have, this is the block diagram of our, of our PIC 16F 1829 chip. Um, now, there's a couple of parts, uh, so I'm going to cover them. So one part here uh, is, uh, we're going to do this, and we'll, we have the, the program memory. This is where the program is stored. The program memory is a special type of electrically writable, electrically erasable, read-only memory called flash. We've talked about this before. Flash is, is, is a type of EEPROM. We don't usually call it EEPROM. We call it flash. Because it's a little denser, we can pack more memory into the same space. But when we do the erase function, we have to erase a, a group of locations, not just a single individual location. And that group could be the, that group could be various sizes. Uh, I think on this chip, it's it's eight locations or something like that. Um, so that's where our program is. Our pro we have eight K of this, and every location has 14 bits. Each location can hold one full instruction, and every instruction is 14 bits. All right, the next thing we have is our random access memory. Here, we each one of these locations is 8 bits, and we have 1K of these. So we have 1,024 8-bit locations numbered 0 to 1023. And then the next thing is we have a little bit, we have 256 bytes of this EEPROM. Now remember I said flash is EEPROM, but, but this is this is EEPROM where you can erase every location individually. So what's nice about this EEPROM, this gives us, uh, and, and whereas over here in our flash, our word length is 14 bits, here in our EEPROM, just like the RAM, it's only eight bits. And so you can, if you have some data you wanna store in a, in a way that's going to still be there after you turn off the power. You can't leave it in RAM because it'll be erased. You have to put it in EEPROM so that it'll be saved. And you can rewrite the EEPROM uh, many times, and so that makes it very handy. And it's, it's only 256 bytes, but that's enough to store a good number of little variables if in case you, uh, you wanted to save some data. All right, the next then we have our, our, our general purpose input output pins. We label those port A, port B, and port C. The little footnote on port B tells you that for the 1825, it doesn't have any port B, only for the 1829. Uh, the, these three ports uh, make up a total of, uh, uh, of 18 pins. But as I said earlier, we use uh, RA3 is our master clear pin, and our programming header and debug header uses that. And we also use uh, RA0 and RA1. So three of these pins are gone for our purposes for this, you know, for this course. You could use them if you really wanted to in a dedicated application, but we want to use debug features, and so we don't want to do that. All right. So, so it turns out, oops, I didn't want to do that. There, it turns out in port A, we have bits... Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So we've got six bits in port A. In port B, we have bits seven, six, five, four. We do not have bits zero, one, two, three. So we've got four bits in port B. But zero, one, two, three are not implemented, only four, five, six, seven. And in port C, we have all eight bits implemented on our 1829, on the 25 they're missing some of these pins because it's only a 14-bit pin. So six, six of these ports are missing. Uh, there's no B port, and there's two C pins that are missing. So that's the six missing pins. Um, okay, now, so next we have our peripheral modules. So when I talk about peripheral modules, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a 10-bit analog-to-digital converter. I'm talking about an SR latch. I'm talking about our, uh, our enhanced uh, uh, capture, compare, and pulse width modulate module. And we have two of those. And then we just have some standard capture, compare, and pulse width modulate uh, modules. So you have up to four 
uh, PWM channels are up to four capture channels or up to four compare channels. Uh, or you can mix and match. You can make it. Uh, if you're doing capture, then you can't be PWM and so forth. Then we have two uh, master synchronous serial ports. It, this only shows one, but there are actually two. And uh, this is where we can implement uh, our SBI and I squared C protocols. Uh, then we have our enhanced universal serial asynchronous receive transmitter. Um, and this, uh, this UART, or, U, or EU SART, is, uh, is a feature on many of these chips. And this is what lets us send out uh, information that we can send to our laptop using our CR2102 adapter and a USB cable plugged into your desktop and a terminal program running on your desktop. And so this is a really nice feature. Uh, we also then have uh, timers. We have timer 0, 1, 2, 4, and 6. And you have a comparator. Now, the, uh, the last module is this clock module. And this is where you can have uh, where you can have an external oscillator, or you can use the internal oscillator, where you can send the uh, the the internal clock can come out on a clock pin, or you can you can have a uh, uh, an external crystal or resonator that the internal circuitry uses to uh, create its own crystal or resonator controlled oscillator. In our case, we're not going to use an external crystal, we're not going to use a resonator, and we're not going to use an external clock module. We're just going to let the internal clock run itself. And you'll see, uh, I'll do this on Thursday, I'll show you what the actual, I'll, I'll put it on the oscilloscope and I'll show you that when we set it for uh, uh, 4 megahertz, that it's really very, very close. Uh, so those are all, that's the block diagram and those are all the features. And we're going to spend some time on all these different pieces and learn how to use some of these uh, features down here. All right, that pretty well concludes this. Uh, there'll be a short quiz after we're all set up, and then we'll have another one on Thursday where I'll talk a little more about the lab.